Welcome to What Are You Drinking? The show that tries to answer what's in the water that we all drink. My name is Chris. I am your water sommelier, aka mad scientist. And today we're going to talk about the basics of water quality testing at home. Now, a couple of disclaimers up front. One, I am not a doctor. I am not a medical professional. I cannot give healthcare advice. Before you make any changes to pretty much anything you do in life, consult a qualified healthcare professional for your specific situation. Number two, I am not a lawyer. I am not an attorney. I cannot give legal advice. So if there's uh, any kind of situation where you want to challenge something that's going on with your living circumstances or with a brand of water you're drinking or something, you need to talk to a real lawyer. I am certainly not that. So let's talk about what you need to do to test water quality at home. Full disclosure, to specifically know exactly what's in your water, you need machinery that most of us, myself included, can't afford to have at home, right? It, there's tools like gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy, uh, really, really big machinery that's you know the size of a, a refrigerator and you know has a five or six digit price tag. However, there are some things you can measure at home with relatively inexpensive devices, and that's what we're going to go through today, the tools that I use to test water. Here's a philosophical perspective because it's going to sort of dictate how I look at water quality and how I think that we should be thinking about water quality in the absence of formal testing. Obviously, if you have formal testing, access to a laboratory, uh, then you can make very specific judgments about what you do and don't want in your water. However, in general, the way I think about water quality is that water is nothing more than H2O, right? Two molecules of hydrogen, one molecule of oxygen in typically liquid format. Anything in our water that isn't water is an added extra. Sometimes those extras are good, right? Calcium in your water, magnesium in your water, iron in your water can provide um, some additional mineral supplementation. Sometimes things that are in our water, like lead or arsenic or microplastics or what have you, are bad. Without a laboratory, it's impossible to know exactly what's in your water. So the philosophy that I approach water testing with for the average person at home like me and you is the less stuff that's in water that isn't water is better. Again, you may have very specific needs that are medically related. I am not the person to answer those things, but that's how I like to think about water quality testing. So there are plenty of devices you can get on Amazon. I've got one here that's a seven in one tester by some company whose name I can't pronounce. And the way we do water quality testing is to take a water sample and then a reference sample and we compare them. We compare the numbers on them to see how they turn out. A big part of these tools, of all tools, is calibration. Uh, so that's one of the first things you have to do is calibrate the tool to make sure that it's working, it's giving you real numbers. If you don't do that, then you can run tests, but you may be reporting on uh, completely incorrect things. So what are the, the measures that we look for in water quality? Well, there's seven of them. Number one is called total dissolved solids. And that's stuff that's in your water. You can't see it, but it's in there. If you were to take a, a cup of water and stir in a spoonful of sugar, the water remains clear, right? There's, there's no visible difference, but now that you know there's a whole bunch of sugar dissolved in that. That's a, that is a dissolved solid. Total dissolved solids is a measure of how much extra stuff is in the water that isn't water. The second measure is called electrical conductivity. And this is measured in a number called microsiemens per uh, centimeter. It is essentially the number of dissolved ions in water. Now, if you uh, don't remember high school chemistry class, ions are simply uh, chemicals, uh, molecules, actually the molecules or atoms that are uh, broken apart in, in the water. So if you remember from, again, high school chemistry, salt is sodium chloride, NaCl. When you dissolve it in water, it kind of breaks apart, right? It becomes sodium ions, chlorine ions. Again, more stuff that's in water that isn't water for the purposes of the show is, is less good. So electrical conductivity measures those ions. It's especially good for measuring things that are metallic because metals tend to be conductive. Third is pH. Uh, this is sort of an acid base indicator and pH of pure water with nothing else in it, like uh, distilled water is 7.0. And it goes from one to 14. One is like 
the strongest acid on the planet that will eat through anything, and 14 is the strongest base that will eat through anything. So things like vinegar would be an acid, would have a low pH number below 7. Things like baking soda dissolved in water would have a high pH number, like 9 or 10, and that's on the base end. Again, we want that kind of like 7.0 or near 7, anywhere from 6 to 8 really uh, is good because it means there's not a lot of extra stuff throwing off the acid of the base of the water. Another measure is salinity, specifically uh, sodium and chloride within water. Your water generally shouldn't have salt in it, right? Um, some waters do. If you have a water softener in your house, um, you've probably, if, you, if you're in your, a home that has a water softener, and it could be an apartment building, it could be a home, and people are dropping off large bags of salt, um, they are putting that in a water softener, and that is, what that does is it removes some types of ions, like calcium and magnesium, and substitutes them with sodium. Again, for some people, that's not a good thing for your health, and in general, salt should not be in your water. Uh, in recent news, there have been things like in uh, Louisiana where seawater has entered freshwater aquifers and contaminated drinking water. O over a certain amount of salinity in the water, your body can't actually get rid of the salt. Uh, this is why if you are trapped on a raft for, you know, out at sea and you drink seawater, you will die because your body can't get rid of the salt fast enough uh, compared to what you're taking in. So again, salinity, one of those things we don't want in our water. There's a measure called specific gravity. Specific gravity is um, how much water weighs. Pure water is a 1.0. There's just, it's just water and nothing else. If you start adding in things like dissolved solids, chemicals, you, you name it, the water gets heavier in the same way that uh, if you think about a maybe a, a bag full of uh, cotton fibers, like cotton balls, and you start adding sand and stuff to it, that bag is just going to get heavier because there's more stuff in there. So specific gravity measures how much heavier the water is because there's more stuff in it. Another measure, which is electrical related to electrical, is uh, oxidation reduction potential. Uh, it's called redox, and this is measured in millivolts. This is how much, uh, how much electrical, well, it, it measures how quickly water can essentially sanitize itself, right? Uh, high oxidation reduction potential would mean that a contaminant in it would uh, be, be trapped by ions and, and sort of zapped out. Um, a low oxidation reduction potential means water can't really do that. It does that through having stuff in your water with high ions, right? So e even though it sounds good, it's not. Your, I, your oxidation reduction potential should be between 650 and 750 millivolts. And finally, which is why we have the microscope here, there are some things that are inert in the sense of uh, they're not electrically conductive. And a lot of these devices that we have at home measure things that you can determine by essentially electricity. Some things like plastic are electrically non-conductive, right? A piece of plastic, you can stick a battery against it and nothing happens. However, it's still not good to have in your water. So the microscope is here because one of the things we, we test for is looking at the water under microscope and trying to determine how much extra stuff we see that shouldn't be there, little things floating around. So that's how we test for this. Now let's go through some of the processes and procedures for home water testing. Um, first thing we're gonna do is you need to have your water, your water should all be roughly at the same temperature, right? So it should be any temperature you want, but things like pH change uh, with changes in temperature. Now they're not huge swings, but they can be, you know, they can be enough to, that if you're trying to compare uh, two, two different bottled waters and one is really cold and one is room temperature, you might get different results. Uh, I have here uh, triple distill, triple filtered reverse osmosis water. So reverse osmosis is a machine that very, is very similar to distilling water. Basically takes a bunch of stuff out, deionizes water, filters it for uh, bacteria and viruses and dissolved solids and all that stuff. And what you end up with is pretty much close to distilled water. It's not exactly, but it is pretty close. Uh, you can, if you want to do this sort of test at home, use actual distilled water, just go buy a jug of it at the supermarket. But for, for what we're doing here, uh, reverse osmosis that's been run through three times through the machine um, is pretty good. So let's talk about calibration first. Whatever instrument you buy, and if you're interested in the stuff that I'm using here, there's a link in the description to the, these tools on Amazon uh, that where you can uh, go ahead and buy them. The first thing we want to do is calibrate. Right? So I'm going to move aside all the stuff. I actually put uh, some of the reverse osmosis water in some of these metal bowls just as cleaning bowls, right? 
And now we have here all purpose vinegar. This is white wine vinegar from Heinz. Doesn't really matter who makes it. What matters is the, the strength. So it says this has been uh, diluted with water to a cleaning strength of 6% acidity. Now 6% acidity for white vinegar works out to a pH at roughly room temperature of about 2.3. So if you've got vinegar and you've got a, a meter that can test, you'll want to take this thing first, as always, wash it off, make sure there's nothing sticking to it that shouldn't be there in your cleanest water you have available. And then stick it in the vinegar. And what you should see is it should go to about 2.3 uh, thereabouts. If it doesn't, if it's, if it's off, then what you want to do is calibrate it. If your meter allows you to calibrate, um, you can calibrate it down to, to get it set to what it's supposed to be at. So we are at 2.2, it's 2.2, 2.3. Okay, there, 2.3. So this is good. This is this means this is working. The meter is working as intended. All right. So we'll put our vinegar aside here. Again, after you do any kind of calibration, wash off the meter, and then dump your washing fluid so that you can pour new. So now we know that our meter is working correctly. The next thing we want to do, we're going to test today some tap water. So I have some regular tap water from my house. Um, I live in the Metro Boston area. All the water in the Metro, most of the water in the Metro Boston area comes from um, the Massachusetts Water Authority. So it all comes from one big system and they do things like put uh, disinfectant products in and stuff to make the water safe to drink. One of the things that is generally true about water treatment is that it uses chemicals to clean water, to remove uh, things that will cause obvious sickness like bacteria and viruses and spores and molds. This in turn creates byproducts in the water. Um, there are um, disinfectant byproducts that can make water less healthy to drink. Now, to be clear, the disinfectant byproducts are much, much, much less harmful than the bad things in water like E. coli, for example. Um, if you have a choice between a water, a cup of water filled with disinfectant byproducts and a water cup filled with a cup of water filled with E. coli, drink the water with the byproducts because the E. coli, you will be sick. So disinfection is essential, but it still does leave stuff in the water that is less than optimal. So if you have the financial resources to do so, consider getting some kind of water filter that can remove that stuff if you like water that has less stuff in it. All right, so we've gone ahead and cleaned our stuff. We're gonna take two containers here. I've got my reverse osmosis water. I'm gonna start on the right with that, and we'll just call out the measurements as we have them. So the pH first of this water, let's see here. We are at 6.6. Now, why is it not seven? Part of reverse osmosis is when it's being cycled through these filters, there's air in there. Water that is exposed to air, there's carbon dioxide in the air that you breathe. The more that water is agitated, the more that water um, splashes around, the more acidic naturally that water becomes because it is absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and creating what's called carbonic acid. If you've ever had, say, like seltzer water, that has water that has a lot of CO2 in it. Uh, that's what makes it bubbly, makes it fizzy. Um, things like soda have that in them, but it makes it more acidic. That's, again, why soda is so acidic. Well, that and soda manufacturers add phosphoric acid, but even just with regular natural seltzer water, club soda, you have um, carbon dioxide dissolved in the water that makes it slightly acidic. So when you do the reverse osmosis process, it is, it is slightly acidic. So we are at 6.5. Let's check now our micro Siemens per centimeter is at five. So that's really good. That's very, there's very, very little in this water. Our total dissolved solids is two parts per million, which is again, very, very good. There's, there's very little in here. Uh, our salinity is zero, which is expected. Our specific gravity is 1.0. Our, our uh, oxidation reduction potential is very low. It's th 395. Um, 
So this water, if you were to use it, say, in an aquarium, would be a really bad idea because there's so low oxidation potential that things like algae and mold would grow very quickly in. Good to drink, bad for an aquarium. So that's our, our reverse osmosis water. Let's go ahead and put that away. Next, same temperature. We're gonna take our tap water. All right, let's do our first check on the tap water on the pH to see where that's going. pH for this water is about 8.1. So it's a little more on the basic side. Still not like bad, it's not bad. It's not like there's a bunch of really weird stuff in here, but that is more on the basic side. And that is probably because of things like <clears throat> um, those disinfectant byproducts in the water. Our second measurement is micro siemens per centimeter. This is electrical conductivity. We are at 202. So there's a fair amount of stuff in this water. Our total dissolved solids is 101 parts per million. So we are more than 50 times the amount of stuff compared to our reverse osmosis water. Our salinity is 0.01%, so not a lot, um, because seawater is 3%, but um, there's, there is some sodium ions in this water. Our specific gravity, 1.001, .001, so there's something in here that isn't water. And our oxidation reduction potential, this is interesting, it's actually lower, it's a 262 millivolts. That's very interesting. Not sure why it's actually lower in that. All right, let's clean off our probe and turn it off. Our last test is again for those particles. Now, I'm not gonna bother testing the reverse osmosis water because if, if the filtration system already removes uh, things that are dissolved solids. It's almost certainly going to re remove any kind of particulates. We're going to get out. If, again, this should be flashbacks to high school uh, chemistry class or biology class. We're going to get out a slide. Let's take a look at this here. This slide is not clean. Let's clean that off. There we go. Slide is clean. We'll get, we'll get out one cover slip. Then you want to just do a quick visual inspection to make sure that there's not weird piles of stuff on it. And take one drop of water from a clean pipette, put it on the slide. Drop the cover slip on, and let's put it into our microscope. Now, what we are looking for here is stuff in the water. And what we're going to do is we're going to just make sure it's we're roughly centered here. There we go. And we're going to count the number of things within the field of view here. This field of view is, what magnification am I at? 160X, excluding water bubbles, because we don't need to count those. I'm just gonna count the number of things within the field of view. They should be zero. We have at the very top of the frame, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, well, that is a huge, like noodle shaped something. 9, 10, 11, 12, about 20 different objects at this resolution. Some of them are really small. Um, you would actually have to, to dig in to make sure that, and I'm going to do that right now to make sure that they're not water bubbles because you will get small water bubbles, but some of these things are really large. This one here is definitely a microplastic. It is a long elong is an elongated object. It looks kind of like a um, like a really long French fry, but clear. Or if you've ever seen those like fiber optic pieces of, of plastic, that is definitely not supposed to be there. There's other microplastics in here, and these are pretty clearly look like plastics, and they're not biological. They don't look like a bacterium. Uh, they don't look like a spore. They're they're big chunky pieces. Of so you got about twenty of those in there. So what do we learn? From the from a calibration perspective, you always do your calibration, make sure your device is working. Then you test your reference solution, which is the reverse osmosis water in this case. Um, found very, very little stuff in there. Then you test your subject. And in this case, this is a straight up tap water. Oh, you can even see some of the, the plastics uh, in there. For the seven electrically based measures plus the particulate measure to find out what's in it. And when you're done, just 
as we are going to be doing for this show, enter it in a spreadsheet. And I'll put the spreadsheet in the show notes as well so that you can get a see what we're testing and see the results over time. But I wanted to go through the basic testing process as a reference for you so that when we do future episodes, you know exactly what we're testing, why, and what those numbers mean. So thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you on the next one. What Are You Drinking is sponsored by TrustInsights.ai. Want to get up to speed on generative AI and its uses, especially for marketing and business? The new self-paced training course, Generative AI for Marketers, will teach you the six major use cases of generative AI, tons of hands-on exercises to get you up to speed quickly, and how to use AI in your job and your organization. The first 100 people who visit TrustInsights.ai slash AI course and use discount code WATER will get $50 off the course. Now, let's get right back to the video. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and if you want to know when new videos are available, hit the bell button to be notified as soon as new content is live.